Okay, so first I will say that I'm addressing this to children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. And um, I think it's, it's something that is worthwhile recording because God gave me many years, so I have a lot to say. <laughs> And I will start at the, my memory of age five in Berlin, Germany. And I was standing down in the street when a Nazi parade went past me. <clears throat> and I heard them singing their famous song, which of course you don't know, but it's uh, connected to Jewish blood being spilled. That was one of their famous songs, Es Amashiet, Die Reihen fest zu schlingen, Judenblut zu spritzen, something, something of that sort. And I uh, was horrified and I ran home and, uh, and I remember the boots on them and the black leather belt with the, uh, they didn't, I don't remember if they actually had weapons also. But to this day, when I see anybody in black boots, I have a memory of that. So it really scared me and I ran home. And <clears throat> my parents uh, listened to me and they said, from now on, anything we talk about at home, you cannot say one more word outside a house. So that was hard for a five-year-old, uh, you know, who likes to talk. <laughs> and it scared me. And I, I suddenly, a world opened in front of me that I never had before. Before that, I lived a very comfortable, happy life. Um, and um, OK, now I'll move on rapidly. I give you, this is a background. I think it must have been, if I'm five, was five, it was 1932-33, something like that, when Hitler first came to came power. To power yeah. So uh, I went to a, I always went to a Jewish school. Uh, uh, the, the school was built on the principles of the Shita of Harav Shemshon uh, of Hirsch, uh, a, a, a man who believed early on in, in modern Jewish history in Torah and Derech Eretz. Torah came first, but Derech Eretz meant not only how you behave, which was important, but also uh, um, a, a, way, a, a way into the wider world, right? And he, he did believe in university. He believed that you could be a totally from person and still have a good education and go into the world, so to say. And my father and mother believed in that chita, and that's why they sent me to that school. Uh, it was, an, it, for its time, an excellent school. It had an, a room for art and a room for physical education, and a room for art and music. And um, I started off with a teacher whose name I actually will mention, because I really loved her, Miss Lipsky. Oh. And at that time, all, I think all the women teachers were what you call today uh, bachelors, bachelorettes, or in those days, old maids, all of them. And uh, I, it practically meant if you went to the teaching edu uh, field, you're going to be an old maid. Wow. Or maybe, uh, really, that's, and they all wore a bun, uh, their hair very far back in a little bun in the back. And um, those who were nice smiled a lot, and those who weren't looked grim. Yeah. So. I had this wonderful teacher, that's why I'm even naming her. And um, we, learned, uh, we learned all the arithmetic, et cetera, but we also learned Chumash, not, not with Rashi. It was nothing like the education today, nothing. I thought I got the best education ever, and really, I didn't. 
So, but it was for its time, I guess, the right thing. So we're talking about the early 30s when I entered school. I liked my school, but I didn't work very hard. <laughs> my teachers were always disappointed. <laughs> so what can I say? Now I have to speak about my older brother, whose yard site happens to be today. Uh, I was extremely attached to him, and annoyingly so. He wanted to get rid of me all the time, and I stuck to him like glue. And we had many fights. We, li we lived in one room that was considered perfectly fine. The room in Germany were very, very big and had a very high ceiling. And he had in the room a little niche for himself. And I was out in the open. And the, the subject usually was who is going to shut the light. Many arguments, and I won a few. Then the other thing I'll tell you about my brother and me as a very young boy, of course. Before bar mitzvah, my mother said after bar mitzvah, he will change. And unfortunately, due to circumstances, he did change. Yeah. But before bar mitzvah, he was a shovav and uh, a, lot of, a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. <laughs> and he drew me into his whole uh, dropper. Shenanigans. Like, uh, yes. Yeah. For instance, when my parents went out, he knew that my father had the machinery for rolling cigarettes. And he pulled out the whole thing. It was like a white piece of paper. You put the tobacco in like this. You rolled it up. There was a little thing to, not a machine, but a little gadget to close it up. And then you smoke. <laughs> so he made me smoke with him. And he said, you smoked with me, so you can't tell. So of course, as soon as my parents came, oh, we did everything to get the smoke out of the house. And as soon as my parents came, I told them, because I was really not, what shall I say? Not a good secret keeper. I, I, I was not a good secret. Don't tell that today. That's different. I'm a perfect secret. <laughs> so my parents, of course, picked on my brother. He, he was older by four years, and it was uh, not a good scene. So the next scene I'll just tell you, because it's fun to tell you. Uh, my father loved a shalom. Um, there was hard, hard to get kosher wine. And he would get raisins and have a vat and, and somehow make wine. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess everybody, people know how to do that. And the vat was in my room, together with my brother, of course. So when it was Arab, oh, it was all for Pesach. That's what it was. And when it was like, a week before Pesach, and the wine was ready and fermented and everything. My brother got drunk on it. <laughs> and, and in the morning, no one could wake him up. And it was like a, 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 a fright. What? The boy doesn't wake up. We shook him. We went. <laughs> and then my mother bent down, and she said, it smells like alcohol. And the discovery was made that he drank enough not to be able to get up the next day. And don't ask what my father said. <laughs> that was just another highlight. The third thing that I'll tell you about my youth, again with my brother, in our room there was a little, not a closet, a, a thing you put pretty things into, a little library thing with pretty gadgets, goodies, doodads. And he had a key to that. And he claimed that it was his own and all the books belonged to him. And if you wanted a book, you had to pay. <laughs> so, of course, when he was out of the house, I found the key. He hid it, but I found it. And I took out a book. I wasn't even really interested. And the end was, it was a very high class book on the, on the line of Shakespeare in German. And I started, I, I learned to read very nicely. And I, I really got quite far. 
And um, he saw that the book was moved because he had put it just so. And he looked at me and said, what, you took that book without permission? And I, I said, yeah. <laughs> so another fight ensued. And the, this is now going to be the last on my youth to tell you. We had somebody, and I don't even know who it was, who every Hanukkah gave each one of us a big round box of candy. And my brother kept it in that closet and never ate a thing. And I ate it right away. It didn't take me long, maybe four or five days, to finish the whole box. Then came the garbage issue. Nobody likes to take out garbage, not even in Berlin in 1935. And so, my brother being the older, that was his job. He had to bring out the garbage, and he didn't want to go. And each time he said, will you go for me? I'll give you one piece of my candy. And by that, I had no more candy. And I always said yes, and he gave me the candy first, and then I didn't go. <laughs> and that happened a few times, and each time I, he fell for it. All right, we're now going to move on. <laughs> I've already told many people the bar mitzvah that my brother had, because bar mitzvah talk is common now among my grandchildren. Uh, his bar mitzvah, he laned beautifully, and the haftorah, very beautifully. He had a good voice also. Already he had a good voice at bar mitzvah. And things were already not very good in, in, Israel, in Germany. And uh, it was a very limited affair. But nevertheless, uh, we had uh, a square of uh, what I would think is marble cake and a square of a different cake, plus a little glass of whiskey. And that was on the table in my house, I was dressed in a black velvet dress with a nice lace white collar. And I was at the door and I said, Mazel tov. And they said, Mazel tov. And then they walked around the long table. Each one sat down to have a little uh, kiddish, you might say. And then when they were finished, they came around the other end to wish Mazel tov and left. The entire kehillah did that. And we refilled because there were, there, were many, there were many people. But that was the way to celebrate the bar mitzvah. Then we had a private little, uh, our own family, which consisted of two children and parents. And we had a very nice meal, catered by somebody. And my brother got two white shirts and I think several pens. And that was his bar mitzvah. And I begged my father to please get him a bike. And, and he, my father, in the, after much haggling, <laughs> he got him a bike. What size was the kehila? I, it seemed large to me. I was always in shul. Oh, Friday night, I was always in shul, and Shabbos morning as well. As I already told that to many people, dressed with white gloves right. and patent leather shoes and a big sailor hat that, with a ribbon underneath. And off I went to shoe. My father went to shoe with a cylinder hoot. It's, you know what that is? It's up straight like this and it's sort of top hat, a top hat, yeah. a top hat. And that's how people were. Yeah. And I, I was on the mechitza um, uh, upstairs, you know, upper floor. And it was usually filled with women. Yeah. And the men were obviously all there. It was a kehillah, a large kehillah, yeah. a large kehillah. We, uh, because the debate came up only recently, we lived uh, in the western part of, uh, of Berlin. And, um, and the, the really kosher bakery, butch, butcher, et cetera, all that life was not in the western part of Berlin, but in the eastern part of Berlin. Grenadierstrasse. Anybody listening who knows that? <laughs> in other words, it was, uh, for, those, uh, for my children who know Forest Hills, 
uh, instead of, uh, we lived in Forest Hills, and the Jewish part was in uh, the east side, lower east side. So that was a distance also probably, maybe. And uh, so we, uh, I guess my mother had to go quite a distance to get food, etc. And but you're now, saying there was a Kehila nonetheless that was pretty close to your home. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. The Kehila had a lot of doctors and lawyers in it. Ah, so you it, didn't have the services. Not really. We didn't. didn't I don't sales, remember. You know, I don't remember any any goods close by. We took a, a trolley car to buy Americana. This is specially set for your father. Okay, what's well, Americana? Because an Americana was a cookie that was black and white. Okay. All right, we, we got to move on or I'll be yeah, here yeah, forever. Yeah. Okay. So I'm moving past my childhood, which by and large was okay until, let's say, 37, 38. 37. In 38, in, in October 38. You're 11. I, I am, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I, 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 am, I am still 11, right? Mm -hmm. In October 38, the Nazis came to full power and all the laws began earlier, actually, little by little. Uh, I don't, I can't go through all of them, but I'll tell you, you had to go to a Jewish doctor if you were sick, you had to go to a Jewish store if you wanted to buy, and they closed the Jewish stores, so where were you? And uh, you had to go to a Jewish school, which meant suddenly there was an influx of many, many students into my class. Uh, the Jewish teachers had to teach only in Jewish schools. Uh, doctors uh, were li uh, no, there were no 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 university entry at all. Um, what else can I say? And, the, and my neighbors started to spit at us. And be, uh, my neighbors in my building, because you know, in those in the, in Berlin, you lived mixed with Goyim all the time. Because that's how it was. We were the minority, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I would say only two families in my whole building were Jewish that I know of. And, uh, and uh, ev everything was, was suddenly turned upside down. But the worst thing, of course, was that in October, the Nazis knocked on my door at very early, 5 a.m., and said, where's your, I opened the door, and they said, where's your father? We want him and your brother. And there was no playing around. I called them, and my father said to my brother, take the tefillin and a toothbrush and a warm coat. And that's what he took, and that's, with that they went. And, uh, and we didn't know where they went. Uh, and you would say, I think, my whole world fell in upon my head because then we were just my mother and me, uh, I don't think she knew where the money was, uh, uh, if any, and that she was just really helpless. And we didn't know where our parent, my father and brother were. And for three weeks we didn't know. But what did happen was neighbors and other people came and talked and said it happened to them also. So when you have like a larger group, you feel a little bit better. You feel you're not alone. And there were people there who were, you know, who had a, a background in knowing a little bit. And uh, they said, uh, you, you have to start doing this, that, and the other. And on top of that, in my mailbox every day, we found a note from the police that said, show up at the police and explain why you haven't left the country. And my mother didn't go. She sent me. And I went because my mother was sure they would not harm a child. Mm -hmm. And so I went. And uh, what, did, what could I say at, at my age? Yeah. I said, we, I, my mother said to me, tell, tell them we didn't get a, a, an exit visa, so we can't go. This went on every single day. They sent new messages. Yeah. And I went again and again. 
and it was very traumatic. And the school then, so we have no knowledge of my, my father, brother. After three weeks, we got a postcard that said, we are well, try to send us shoes. So we understood from that that they must have been walking many distances. And they are well, but probably under bad circumstances. And I do remember, oh, and we had to make the shoes look old. So I, I remember we scrubbed the shoes so they looked scuffy, but at least they were good shoes. Yeah. I don't know if they ever got them. I hope they did. I, I, never, I never, those things never came up again. But I'm only giving you the feel of how it was. We were scared to pieces. And um, I, as I've told you, after three weeks, we found out where they were in a place called Sponshin, which is very close, directly adjacent to the German border with Poland. And we found out later that it was sort of, a, it, was an, it was a camp. It was not a labor camp. It was a camp that was guarded by Polish guards. But it was, it was a place that had nothing. The, the Jewish people had to make latrines because there were no toilets. Yeah. Uh, they had to make, the, but would you believe at the end of the time they were there, which was not, as far, my, my father was not there that long, I would say a year. He was there for a year? It looks like, uh, now that I say, he went in 38, we left in 39. Wow. So uh, not a full year, because it was from October to April. Okay. So in that time, they managed there to build good bathrooms, school. They had a school, a yeshiva for children, oh. everything for children, everything they did. It's it's me kam Yisrael, under those terrible circumstances. Food was a big problem. Everything was hygiene was a terrible problem. A lot of people died from hygienic problems. Anyway, I'm going back to our side, my mother and me, that I know better. Uh, we, well, we were a little bit reassured, at least we, we knew they were alive and well. And we understood under bad circumstances. And on our side, we were desperate. We were running out of money. My mother sold the furniture. Mm. But everybody else sold the furniture. All the people who were in our boat also sold service. So the Germans knew what they were getting. We didn't get any money practically for it. We moved out of our beautiful apartment to a one room somewhere in, in a Jewish home, of course. And as I already told many people, for Pesach, I remember, I mean, I remember many things, but I remember so, so much that for Pesach, my mother and I had the Seder under the table because we were afraid that the Nazis would see the light and knock on the door. So things were, I, I can't even really tell you the atmosphere. I have to explain the atmosphere to you. Here we were desperate because every day the police said, you have to leave. And now that we know what happened, that was already the good times because they let us leave. They wanted us to leave. But we didn't know that, of course. Uh, we, we were desperate. What are we going to do? We, don't, we, don't, we can't go anywhere. And now here comes this miraculous story that really I always think of Eliyahu Hanavi, who turned out to be a goy. Mm. Imagine such a thing. We got a, a knocking on the door. And there, and we had to open. So there stood a man who spoke pretty well in German and asked for Mr. Fishman, my father. And we didn't know what to do with him. We said, we said, you know, he was taken away. So this man said, I come from London. He used to correspond with me business letters. I got to know him through that as a wonderful man. And I found out that in Germany, they're doing bad things to Jews. I came to see what happened with Mr. Fishman. So we told him. 
and we, we, we knew where he was also. He said, this is your problem. I promise you, I will get you certificates to Palestine. Mm. And with that, he left. And he actually visited my father in the camp and brought him a, a watch. Wow. I don't know why he thought a watch would be important, <laughs> but that's what he brought him. And he told my father the same thing. And we were like in dreamland, and we said, lo yitachen, it's just not going to happen. And we continued living under these really bad circumstances, which were getting worse every day. Every day, a new law against Jews, every single day. And, and um, the tension was terrible. But lo and behold, right after that terrible Pesach, uh, and not long after, we got the certificates. Two for me and one for my father. I forgot to tell you that my brother was taken out of that camp by, again, a tzaddik of, of a man by the name of Rabbi Schoenfeld, who arranged from England to get uh, visas to come to England uh, to help to save the Jews. And he only concentrated on people under a certain age, and my brother fit that age. Uh, and so one day in, the late, in that camp, uh, all these boys that were called left for, in, for Gateshead, for England, England, and my brother eventually ended in the Gateshead yeshiva. So while that happened, we got our certificate in Berlin, and Kanil and my brother, my father, got it in the camp, and went out of the camp with that to Gedingen, where I understand Debbie will go, uh, which is the port in, in Poland, and from there he went to Haifa, and we. Okay, so there's another little story. My mother only had, she got the certificates, and we were able to leave. And she had only enough money for, the, for, for her to go on a train. We had to go to a train to Italy. And to, after that, enough money for the two of us for the ship to leave from uh, Trieste, from uh, close to Trieste, um, what is the port, uh, port in Italy next to Trieste, um, and, um, and, and, we, and she didn't have enough money to pay for my train. So it was very scary, I, and I did know about it. And I got on the train without a ticket. Mm. But to our great mazel, 60, at least 60 kids were on a children's transport without parents, and madrichim were with these uh, 60 kids. And my mother approached one of the madrichim, and she said, you have to hide my daughter, because she has no ticket. And if the, Na the Nazis patrolled those trains, oh, and they if did. they, yes. They weren't just saying get rid of them and no that's their they were patrolling all, they always were patrolling the trains to the border mm -hmm. and now they were nazis they used to be plain people now they were all nazis and if they catch me they'll send me back and my mother will go with me she yeah. won't let me go alone so it was very very traumatic for me i knew this and for my mother no doubt even worse and they decided to put me in the toilet and stand there in front of the toilet as if they're waiting to get in. And it worked. But meantime, of course, I lost my whole bitachon <laughs> atzmi there. And um, I never came out of that toilet till we crossed the border. And, that, and we crossed the border. The, 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 actually, this is quite interesting now, now that I think about it. The border was Austria, and Austria was captured first. But not yet, obviously. We just, just came up before the war. And um, so we crossed the border into Austria, and from Austria to Switzerland, Switzerland to Italy, something on that order. 
and we arrived in Switzerland at night, uh, Italy at night, and Jews there knew we were coming. Oh. They apparently knew about the 60 uh, kids, mm -hmm. and they, they had come out at night, it was at night, and, and I remember they had tables full of tables full of goodies, basically. I guess they concentrated on kids. Oh, yeah. And then we, we also ate. I was, we were the only, I, I don't remember any other grown-ups on the ship. Hmm. I mean, they might have been, but I don't remember them. And so I remember, of course, my mother and I and the 60 kids and the Madrichim, this I remember. And I can only tell you that I had a very good time on that ship. <laughs> Uh, and so did the 60 kids. We were really not good, well behaved at all. To us, it seemed like, I guess, a freedom trip. Yeah. And we liked who, whoever was on a big ship. We, we, we were on a big, this big ship. And here I'll tell you just one thing from the ship <laughs> that we all did. I discovered. Okay, so just to be clear, you ended up in the train you took to Italy. Yeah. And then from Italy, you went to the port and got onto a ship. And you already had your certificate. You're on your way directly. To, to, to Palestine. Palestine. Okay. Correct. All right. The only thing I'll tell you about the ship incident, my mother was too sick to come out of her birth. <laughs> so I was free to do what I wanted. Yeah. I was not sick. And we unrolled the toilet paper in every toilet because we knew that the, in the end there was a little silver thing with a little toy of some kind, and that was our job on the ship. We were not the best behaved children, but you cannot blame 60 kids plus me on the, on the rampage. Right. I mean, what do you expect, really? And we all felt free suddenly, free from everything. We left everything behind. And I had a mother with me, and I was expecting a father there. But they left their parents. Mm -hmm. So, but they were, they felt good. They, they're kids. kids. And they didn't quite, they didn't sink in. Right. So they went elsewhere when we landed, of course. And I, we had a tremendous reunion with my father. And then we went, okay, I'll tell you this. How long am I going to speak on I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then we went, okay, we, we got a taxi with a Yiddish-speaking driver. Okay. Because I, I'm very blurry about who set up everything. But somebody set something up in, the, in Tel Aviv for us to go to. And this Yiddish-speaking driver um, had a gun uh, with him. And my father said, <laughs> Mapitam, what is this? Oh, he said, the Arabs are on a riot. <laughs> uh, so uh, my father and mother went from the, from the fire to the frying pan. And I, I was excited. What do you mean? A pistol? This is my whole, my eyes popped wide open. And I was sitting in the rear. And then the, the Yiddish driver said, when I tell you to go on the floor, go on the floor because I'm going to zoom past this area. So <laughs> my parents were petrified, oh, and, I, <laughs> and I, I figured I'm going to see Arabs. What an exciting sight. I mean, I'm in the Middle East. This is different. Camels, donkeys, yeah. Arabs. And I was looking out the window while, while, while my poor parents were on the floor. Nothing happened. We passed the area, but clearly it was not a good time. Mm. 39 was not a good time. When and the, was there a good time? No, I, don't, we don't, I, I am now in the good time. We're now in the good time. <laughs> and we still have Pigot, uh, uh, but never mind. A long life, and I, I went through a lot of times like that. Yeah. And, and I thought it was the greatest thing. It was like a show. <laughs> <laughs> we, then we arrived in Tel Aviv, and then I saw suddenly on the street, English soldiers walking back and forth. And um, the, the Yiddish driver said, poo, poo, poo on them. 
And, um, and he brought us to this house. Now, to me, the house looked big, but I, I understand it couldn't have been big. Tel Aviv in 1939 didn't have big houses. And there were several rooms, I would say, three, four rooms. And we were put into one of those rooms. But if you had a family of 10, you were also put in one room, because that's all they had. And this was the time of the Mapilim. And uh, I did not know any of that, of course. And uh, my mother got what, what I think in English you would call a Bunsen burner. Yeah. And I have to maybe explain that yeah, to probably. children. Uh, it, it's, it's like, it's a gas thing. Mm -hmm. It's little and you light it from below and it has an a, a possibility don't tell me it's not working, I'll cry. No, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there's a flame below, and then you put your pot on it, if you, you know, and, and you cook that way, right. which is, you know, not what my mother was used to, you can be sure. And, um, and uh, everything, the nochiyut were pretty poor, right. but, but, but livable. Uh, not for, for long, but it was livable. And, um, and, and I was very excited to be in a Jewish city, very excited. Can't tell you how excited I was. And um, the, 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 the yam was mamish at the corner. Oh, wow. Yeah, we were like, I don't know, it wasn't two minutes. Wow. Right. And this house was smack practically there. My school, I went to school there in the Moria school, which still stands, and it's still a Mizrahi school. You're kidding. It still stands, and I know people who said I went to it. And uh, that was also like, the yam was like there. Wow. And uh, I guess... Uh, Great location. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe they tore all that down. Yeah, I'm sure. uh, I really know the exact address because one of the cards I have has the address. So I should have looked that up before. Uh, but, but to me, the whole thing was a good dream. A, a what do you call it? A fantasy that comes true. A fantasy comes true because I always dreamt about Israel, for pa to call it Palestine then. I always dreamt about that. I always had the feeling that's where I belong, always. I guess it came from my parents. I mean, it didn't come from nothing. And, uh, and you see that they always sent me, as soon as there was a possibility, if my father had a penny, he sent me to school. That was his, his was big, he was big on that. Anyway, I, I had six months or so, uh, we can figure it out from, uh, from arriving, let's say, I arrived after Pesach, and we left in November. Uh -huh. okay. So I cried buckets when I heard we were leaving. Really? Buckets. I was so happy there. But I was happy for a different reason. I was happy because my parents were busy with themselves. There was really no control over me. I did what I, whatever I did. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, adventures I had in that house. So some of you know some of it. So one was that I didn't sleep at night too well because cockroaches were in the house. Oh. And I never had seen one. I let out a yell you can't imagine. My father hit me because he thought somebody attacked me. <laughs> and he hit you? Okay. He hit me. In those days, he was allowed to do that. Yeah, well. Yeah. So, he, because he was so scared. <laughs> I, I let out such a scream. So I figured, um, you know, I, I didn't sleep too well at night because I thought a cockroach would come at me. And I, I wandered the hall, and I looked out the window, and it was like, really deep into the night. What do I see? So you see how close I was to the yam. I see them with the boats. Oh. How close I must have been. And, and maybe I didn't see boats. Maybe I just saw the people. I saw people coming from that area. Let's say that's what happened, from the yam area. Mm -hmm. And they come into the house, and they're in one of the empty rooms. I said, what is that? 
in the middle of the night. Mm. And I, I mean, I never even maybe asked my parents, I'm not sure. The next thing I know, they're gone. Morning, they're gone. No, oh. no people. Mm -hmm. so, so I went and looked deliberately another night. Every night this happened. I only watched two times. And then I much later understood what happened. Because yeah. I never could make friends with anybody. They were always gone. Mm. So one or two people lived like us that were legal. Uh, okay. So they also had children. So we got together. I mean, what do children do? And I decided, this is the story I'm telling you now, that the woman who lived above us, there was like apparently an upstairs, I decided she was a German spy. Because, I, A, because her German was like, maybe two, we spoke a very good German, so I don't know, maybe her looks. Maybe I decided she's not Jewish in my mind. Uh, but she really hardly spoke to us. It was no reason, really, no, no logical reason. And we, we, what did we do? We get the girls, the kids, the kids got together, and I decided that we need money, and nobody had money. We were all refugees without a penny. So we said that we would take the glass jars that people use for shamanet and whatever else, bakbukim, whatever, and we will be the ones that get the picadon. Mm. And this is why we went to the door of this woman upstairs also, and we collected and so on and so forth. And we did that quite a while. And we made some money, and I spent my money on fruit, if you don't, wouldn't believe it, not on goodies, fruit. And the kids, whatever they spent money on. And um, we had a jolly time with all that. Then there was a garden that had turtles in it that was fun. In other words, we were not. We were. We were all happy. The kids were all happy. Yeah. My parents were not happy. Yeah, they were probably suffering. Uh, my not only did they suffer, but the only employment my father, who was a businessman, could get was to climb on orange trees, trees, mm. and throw down the oranges, which yeah. he could not do. Right. And that's the only employment they offered. So I guess somehow or other we must have had residual money to live on. And uh, he wrote letters to America. He was such a well-known expert on a certain field in his business that people knew about him. And uh, he, that's how this London man was so excited about him. And the, there was a person in, uh, in, in a company that answered my father and said, we will send you a visa to enter the United States. And they had to guarantee, Israel, uh, the United States was not interested in having us. Yeah. So they had to guarantee that they would, we would not fall um, uh, on their shoulders, so mm -hmm. to say. So someone did that, it's not important. But we already, my father had to get out because there was no industry in Israel, in Palestine. There was certainly nothing for him to do and he had to make a living, he was still a young man. And my mother suffered from the heat, something terrible. And the cooking in the Benson burner was not really meant for her. <laughs> And, uh, you know, compared to what happened in the Holocaust, it's all a joke. But for me, it was not a joke. And for our family, it was not a joke. It was trauma. And, and, I, and I kind of undid that trauma in those sh that short time that I lived in a very besieged Palestine. Mm. Things were not good in Palestine. This was sinner time. Nobody had food. Yeah. And the, and the English people were not much better than the Nazis, a degree better, well, maybe a big degree. But look, they sent those poor people to, to, to camps when they came. They came from the Holocaust and they sent the people to camps right. unless they had a certificate like we. So, it, it, so you were the rarity so, yes. of people who had certificates. Yes, I was. So, so, okay, so now we'll move on. 
And I will tell you a little bit about the trip. The war broke out. The World War II broke out. And many countries were drawn into it, but some countries were still neutral. So that Greece was neutral. And that's important for my story. And we went off, after I cried buckets, we went off on a ship that was meant to carry cattle. And we were on the upper deck. It was not a long trip, so we didn't have to really sleep there. We were on the upper deck, and below us were cows. And the cows carried on a terrible mooing. <laughs> oh, there were actual cattle on the ship. Yes. Oh and, and the ship was not, it, it was meant to go to Syria and drop off the, co the, co the co cows. And that's what it did. But the, 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 the sea was so unruly that some of the cows died uh, from being pushed together. Me, I wasn't seasick. I again was watching everything. And it was exciting for me to see cows. I'm, not, I'm a city girl. I didn't see too many cows. And so um, the ship was a terrible ship. And we did arrive in Greece. Uh, thank God, alive and well. Yeah. And with us were some other people, grown-ups, not too many children. And in Greece, we were put up in a hotel. Oh. Yes. And we were in this hotel a uh, very short time. We were supposed to be there in order to wait for the Nea Hellas. That's the name of the ship. And it apparently was en route. Oh. We, we didn't go. So I do have to divert, uh, digest, digest, no, divert, and tell you a story in Greece. Obviously, we didn't know Greek. How long were you hanging around? In uh, a couple it, days? it seemed to me not long. Okay. And I had in between the flu, right. which was not a good thing. But anyway, my father, Olav Hasholam, said, I'm checking up on the kashrut of the ship. And <laughs> so he said, come with me. I went with him. And we arrive at the Rav that gives the herrscher for the ship. And he lived in sort of a cave. Okay. A little bit like in Mea Sharim, if you want to go into deep shops. You, mm -hmm. this, that's what it looked like. Yeah. You had to go down a couple of steps. It looked dark to me. And my father spoke to him, forget about Yiddish, Greek people do not know Yiddish. My father spoke to him in Hebrew. Huh. And so they had a little discussion, maybe 10 minutes. My father had a, t a, a, a sign that told him where to go. Every year I kept asking. And as I said, you, nobody understood English. Nobody understood English then. <coughs> <laughs> and you spoke in, in Greek, and, and we couldn't do that. Anybody? There was no international language. Everyone spoke their language. Right. And we, in 39, the Greek common people did not speak English. Right. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and we got back to the hotel. My father said, Menturnished Essen, which means you're not allowed to eat. <laughs> Oh, no. He was not impressed from this rabbi, and he gave us instructions that we could eat the following things. We could eat eggs, we could eat potatoes, we could eat vegetables, and maybe fish, but only if we know what kind of a fish it is. <coughs> but he said he will not eat those things. He will see what he could do. So. You see that. I'm what, surprised that even in such desperate, <coughs> uh, desperate times, my father you know, was, Kashul, was so reminded you know. me of Yitzhak a little bit. Oh, okay. My father did not was not a man who looked left or right. What he thought, like that. So, but for us, he, what well, he felt. He was Mifarien. Absolutely. Okay. So we were on that ship. Oh, the, the one thing that happened on that ship, and that's why I mentioned uh, n neutral, is in the middle of the, uh, of the ocean, during the war, 
a U-boat appeared. A U-boat? A Nazi U-boat. Right. And the captain wanted to come on board. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was to take Jews off. Oof. And the Greek captain would not allow it. He said, we're neutral, I don't allow it. You want to start a war with Greece? And they were not ready for that. So he left. And that was a very dangerous, terrible time. But the good part for me was I saw whales. I wow. saw, um, I don't know if I saw porpoises. I, whales I saw. Anyway, that was all, also exciting, the ship. And the, and the ocean was like something very unusual. And um, when we, and when we were, this is the last part I will tell for today. I yeah. can't keep no, no, talking. No, no, I figure whenever you're ready. Yeah. Well, uh, be... Nobody will want to listen that long. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of breaking it up. Yeah. yeah, you have to break it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then the last time I'll say is that uh, when we got off the, we did not get off the boat because it arrived after Skier on Shabbos. <laughs> and, and, and we were oh not goodness. off. Everybody got off the boat. The captain comes and begs us to get off the boat because if we don't get off the boat, a lot more people will have to stay behind. And my father said, we are not getting off the boat. It was Shabbos, not not Arab right. Shabbos, Shabbos. We're not getting off, and he'll explain nicely to my to the captain that he needs to three, see three stars. Mm. And the man, I thought he was crazy, I'm sure. Yeah. And here we are, huddled together, <laughs> not getting off the boat. And finally, the three stars came, Baruch Hashem, and we left the boat. <laughs> and when we got to, to Hoboken, there was no one waiting for us because this man thought he missed, we missed the boat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's about as much as I want to do. One more question. All right. This was a direct trip from Greece. Direct trip. Straight to the Very US. long, very oh, yeah, long. Weeks, probably, oh, weeks, huh? weeks. Weeks. Yeah. Yes, weeks. Okay, so we'll continue in the U.S. Yeah, in I a guess. Later so. time. All right, thank you very much. You're this welcome. Is great. <laughs>